Adventure Nine of the Adventures of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. Adventure Nine: The Adventure of the Engineer's Thumb. Of all the problems which have been submitted to my friend Mr. Sherlock Holmes for solution during the years of our intimacy, there were only two which I was the means of introducing to his notice, that of Mr. Hatherley's thumb and that of Colonel Warburton's madness. Of these, the latter may have afforded a finer field for an acute and original observer but the other was so strange in its inception, and so dramatic in its details, that it may be the more worthy of being placed upon record, even if it gave my friend fewer openings for those deductive methods of reasoning by which he achieved such remarkable results. The story has, I believe, been told more than once in the newspapers, but, like all such narratives, its effect is much less striking when set forth en bloc in a single half-column of print than when the facts slowly evolve before your own eyes, and the mystery clears gradually away as each new discovery furnishes a step which leads on to the complete truth. At the time, the circumstances made a deep impression upon me and the lapse of two years has hardly served to weaken the effect. It was in the summer of eighty-nine, not long after my marriage, that the events occurred which I am now about to summarise. I had returned to civil practice, and had finally abandoned Holmes in his Baker Street rooms, although I continually visited him and occasionally even persuaded him to forego his bohemian habits so far as to come and visit us. My practice had steadily increased, and as I happened to live at no very great distance from Paddington Station, I got a few patients from among the officials. One of these, whom I had cured of a painful and lingering disease, was never weary of advertising my virtues and of endeavouring to send me on every sufferer over whom he might have any influence. One morning, at a little before seven o'clock, I was awakened by the maid tapping at the door to announce that two men had come from Paddington and were waiting in the consulting-room. I dressed hurriedly, for I knew by experience that railway cases were seldom trivial, and hastened downstairs. As I descended, my old ally, the guard, came out of the room and closed the door tightly behind him. "'I've got him here,' he whispered, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. "'He's all right.' "'What is it, then?' I asked, for his manner suggested that it was some strange creature which he had caged up in my room. "'It's a new patient,' he whispered. I thought I'd bring him round myself, then he couldn't slip away. There he is, all safe and sound. I must go now, Doctor. I have my duties, just the same as you. And off he went, this trusty tout, without even giving me time to thank him. I entered my consulting room and found a gentleman seated by the table. He was quietly dressed in a suit of heather tweed, with a soft cloth cap which he had laid down upon my books. Round one of his hands he had a handkerchief wrapped, which was mottled all over with bloodstains. He was young, not more than five and twenty, I should say, with a strong masculine face, but he was exceedingly pale and gave me the impression of a man who was suffering from some strong agitation which it took all his strength of mind to control. "'I am sorry to knock you up so early, doctor,' said he, "'but I have had a very serious accident during the night. I came in by train this morning, and on inquiring at Paddington as to where I might find a doctor, a worthy fellow very kindly escorted me here.' 
I gave the maid a card, but I see that she has left it upon the side table. I took it up and glanced at it. Mr. Victor Hatherley, Hydraulic Engineer, 16A Victoria Street, third floor. That was the name, style, and abode of my morning visitor. I regret that I have kept you waiting, said I, sitting down in my library chair. You are fresh from a night journey, I understand, which is in itself a monotonous occupation. Oh, my night could not be called monotonous, said he, and laughed. He laughed very heartily, with a high ringing note, leaning back in his chair and shaking his sides. All my medical instincts rose up against that laugh. Stop it! I cried. Pull yourself together. And I poured out some water from a carafe. It was useless, however. He was off in one of those hysterical outbursts which come upon a strong nature when some great crisis is over and gone. Presently he came to himself once more, very weary and pale-looking. I've been making a fool of myself, he gasped. Not at all. Drink this. I dashed some brandy into the water, and the colour began to come back to his bloodless cheeks. That's better, said he. And now, doctor, perhaps you would kindly attend to my thumb, or rather to the place where my thumb used to be. He unwound the handkerchief and held out his hand. It gave even my hardened nerves a shudder to look at it. There were four protruding fingers, and a horrid red spongy surface where the thumb should have been. It had been hacked or torn right out from the roots. "'Good heavens!' I cried. "'This is a terrible injury. It must have bled considerably.' "'Yes, it did.' I fainted when it was done, and I think that I must have been senseless for a long time. When I came to, I found that it was still bleeding, so I tied one end of my handkerchief very tightly round the wrist, and braced it up with a twig. Excellent! You should have been a surgeon. It is a question of hydraulics, you see, and came within my own province. This has been done, said I, examining the wound by a very heavy and sharp instrument. A thing like a cleaver, said he. An accident, I presume? By no means. What, a murderous attack? Very murderous indeed. You horrify me. I sponged the wound, cleaned it, dressed it, and finally covered it over with cotton wadding and carbolized bandages. He lay back without wincing, though he bit his lip from time to time. "'How is that?' I asked when I had finished. "'Capital! Between your brandy and your bandage I feel a new man. I was very weak, but I have had a good deal to go through.' "'Perhaps you had better not speak of the matter. It is evidently trying to your nerves.' "'Oh, no, not now.' I shall have to tell my tale to the police. But between ourselves, if it were not for the convincing evidence of this wound of mine, I should be surprised if they believed my statement, for it is a very extraordinary one, and I have not much in the way of proof with which to back it up. And even if they believe me, the clues which I can give them are so vague that it is a question whether justice will be done. Ha! cried I. If it is anything in the nature of a problem which you desire to see solved, I should strongly recommend you to come to my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, before you go to the official police. Oh, I have heard of that fellow, answered my visitor, and I should be very glad if he would take the matter up, though of course I must use the official police as well. Would you give me an introduction to him? I'll do better. I'll take you round to him myself. I should be immensely obliged to you. We'll call a cab and go together. 
we shall just be in time to have a little breakfast with him. Do you feel equal to it? Yes, I shall not feel easy until I have told my story. Then my servant will call a cab, and I shall be with you in an instant. I rushed upstairs, explained the matter shortly to my wife, and in five minutes was inside a hansom, driving with my new acquaintance to Baker Street. Sherlock Holmes was, as I expected, lounging about his sitting-room in his dressing-gown, reading the agony column of the Times, and smoking his before-breakfast pipe, which was composed of all the plugs and dottles left from his smokes of the day before, all carefully dried and collected on the corner of the mantelpiece. He received us in his quietly genial fashion, ordered fresh rashers and eggs, and joined us in a hearty meal. When it was concluded, he settled our new acquaintance upon the sofa, placed a pillow beneath his head, and laid a glass of brandy and water within his reach. It is easy to see that your experience has been no common one, Mr. Hatherley, said he. Pray lie down there and make yourself absolutely at home. Tell us what you can, but stop when you are tired, and keep up your strength with a little stimulant. Thank you, said my patient. But I have felt another man since the doctor bandaged me, and I think that your breakfast has completed the cure. I shall take up as little of your valuable time as possible, so I shall start at once upon my peculiar experiences. Holmes sat in his big armchair with the weary, heavy-lidded expression which veiled his keen and eager nature, while I sat opposite to him, and we listened in silence to the strange story which our visitor detailed to us. "'You must know,' said he, "'that I am an orphan and a bachelor.' residing alone in lodgings in London. By profession I am a hydraulic engineer, and I have had considerable experience of my work during the seven years that I was apprenticed to Venner and Matheson, the well-known firm of Greenwich. Two years ago, having served my time, and having also come into a fair sum of money through my poor father's death, I determined to start in business for myself and took professional chambers in Victoria Street. I suppose that every one finds his first independent start in business a dreary experience. To me it has been exceptionally so. During two years I have had three consultations and one small job, and that is absolutely all that my profession has brought me. My gross takings amount to twenty-seven pounds ten shillings. Every day from nine in the morning until four in the afternoon I waited in my little den, until at last my heart began to sink, and I came to believe that I should never have any practice at all. Yesterday, however, just as I was thinking of leaving the office, my clerk entered to say there was a gentleman waiting who wished to see me upon business. He brought up a card, too, with the name of Colonel Lysander Stark engraved upon it. Close at his heels came the Colonel himself, a man rather over the middle size, but of an exceeding thinness. I do not think that I have ever seen so thin a man. His whole face sharpened away into nose and chin, and the skin of his cheeks was drawn quite tense over his outstanding bones. Yet this emaciation seemed to be his natural habit, and due to no disease, for his eye was bright, his step brisk, and his bearing assured. He was plainly but neatly dressed, and his age, I should judge, would be nearer forty than thirty. "'Mr. Hatherley,' said he, with something of a German accent, "'you have been recommended to me, Mr. Hatherley.' as being a man who is not only proficient in his profession but is also discreet and capable of preserving a secret i bowed feeling as flattered as any young man would at such an address 
may i ask who it was who gave me so good a character well perhaps it is better that i should not tell you that just at this moment i have it from the same source that you are both an orphan and a bachelor and are residing alone in london that is quite correct i answered but you will excuse me if i say that i cannot see how all this bears upon my professional qualifications i understand that it was on a professional matter that you wished to speak to me undoubtedly so but you will find that all i say is really to the point i have a professional commission for you but absolute secrecy is quite essential absolute secrecy you understand and of course we may expect that more from a man who is alone than from one who lives in the bosom of his family if i promise to keep a secret said i you may absolutely depend upon my doing so he looked very hard at me as i spoke and it seemed to me that i had never seen so suspicious and questioning an eye do you promise then said he at last yes i promise absolute and complete silence before during and after no reference to the matter at all either in word or writing i have already given you my word very good he suddenly sprang up and darting like lightning across the room he flung open the door the passage outside was empty that's all right said he coming back i know that clerks are sometimes curious as to their master's affairs now we can talk in safety he drew up his chair very close to mine and began to stare at me again with the same questioning and thoughtful look a feeling of repulsion and of something akin to fear had begun to rise within me at the strange antics of this fleshless man even my dread of losing a client could not restrain me from showing my impatience i beg that you will state your business sir said i my time is of value heaven forgive me for that last sentence but the words came to my lips how would fifty guineas for a night's work suit you he asked most admirably i say a night's work but an hour's would be nearer the mark i simply want your opinion about a hydraulic stamping machine which has got out of gear if you show us what is wrong we shall soon set it right ourselves what do you think of such a commission as that the work appears to be light and the pay munificent precisely so we shall want you to come to-night by the last train where to to eiford in berkshire it is a little place near the borders of oxfordshire and within seven miles of reading there is a train from paddington which would bring you there at about eleven fifteen very good i shall come down in a carriage to meet you there is a drive then yes our little place is quite out in the country it is a good seven miles from eiford station then we can hardly get there before midnight i suppose there would be no chance of a train back i should be compelled to stop the night yes we could easily give you a shakedown that is very awkward could i not come at some more convenient hour we have judged it best that you should come late it is to recompense you for any inconvenience that we are paying to you a young and unknown man a fee which would buy an opinion from the very heads of your profession still of course if you would like to draw out of the business there is plenty of time to do so i thought of the fifty guineas and of how very useful they would be to me not at all said i i shall be very happy to accommodate myself to your wishes 
I should like, however, to understand a little more clearly what it is that you wish me to do. Quite so. It is very natural that the pledge of secrecy which we have exacted from you should have aroused your curiosity. I have no wish to commit you to anything without your having it all laid before you. I suppose that we are absolutely safe from eavesdroppers. Entirely. Then the matter stands thus. You are probably aware that Fuller's Earth is a valuable product, and that it is only found in one or two places in England. I have heard so. Some little time ago I bought a small place, a very small place, within ten miles of Reading. I was fortunate enough to discover that there was a deposit of Fuller's earth in one of my fields. On examining it, however, I found that this deposit was a comparatively small one, and that it formed a link between two very much larger ones upon the right and left, both of them, however, in the grounds of my neighbours. These good people were absolutely ignorant that their land contained that which was quite as valuable as a gold mine. Naturally, it was to my interest to buy their land before they discovered its true value, but unfortunately I had no capital by which I could do this. I took a few of my friends into the secret, however, and they suggested that we should quietly and secretly work our own little deposit, and that in this way we should earn the money which would enable us to buy the neighbouring fields. This we have now been doing for some time, and in order to help us in our operations we erected a hydraulic press. This press, as I have already explained, has got out of order, and we wish your advice upon the subject. We guard our secret very jealously, however, and if it once became known that we had hydraulic engineers coming to our little house, it would soon rouse inquiry, and then, if the facts came out, it would be good-bye to any chance of getting these fields and carrying out our plans. That is why I have made you promise me that you will not tell a human being that you are going to Eiford to-night. I hope that I make it all plain. I quite follow you, said I. The only point which I could not quite understand was what use you could make of a hydraulic press in excavating Fuller's earth, which, as I understand, is dug out like gravel from a pit. Ah, said he carelessly, we have our own process. We compress the earth into bricks so as to remove them without revealing what they are. But that is a mere detail. I have taken you fully into my confidence now, Mr. Hatherley, and I have shown you how I trust you. He rose as he spoke. I shall expect you then at Eiford at eleven fifteen. I shall certainly be there. And not a word to a soul. He looked at me with a last long questioning gaze and then, pressing my hand in a cold, dank grasp, he hurried from the room. Well, when I came to think it all over in cool blood, I was very much astonished, as you may both think, at this sudden commission which had been entrusted to me. On the one hand, of course, I was glad, for the fee was at least tenfold what I should have asked, had I set a price upon my own services and it was possible that this order might lead to other ones. On the other hand, the face and manner of my patron had made an unpleasant impression upon me, and I could not think that his explanation of the Fuller's Earth was sufficient to explain the necessity for my coming at midnight, and his extreme anxiety lest I should tell any one of my errand. However, I threw all fears to the winds, ate a hearty supper, drove to Paddington and started off, having obeyed to the letter the injunction as to holding my tongue. 
At Reading I had to change not only my carriage but my station. However, I was in time for the last train to Iford, and I reached the little dim-lit station after eleven o'clock. I was the only passenger who got out there, and there was no one upon the platform save a single sleepy porter with a lantern. As I passed out through the wicket gate, however, I found my acquaintance of the morning waiting in the shadow upon the other side. Without a word he grasped my arm and hurried me into a carriage, the door of which was standing open. He drew up the windows on either side, tapped on the woodwork, and away we went as fast as the horse could go. One horse, interjected Holmes. Yes, only one. Did you observe the colour? Yes, I saw it by the side lights when I was stepping into the carriage. It was a chestnut. Tired looking or fresh? Oh, fresh and glossy. Thank you. I am sorry to have interrupted you. Pray continue your most interesting statement. Away we went, then, and we drove for at least an hour. Colonel Lysander Stark had said that it was only seven miles, but I should think, from the rate that we seemed to go, and from the time that we took, that it must have been nearer twelve. He sat at my side in silence all the time, and I was aware more than once, when I glanced in his direction, that he was looking at me with great intensity. The country roads seemed to be not very good in that part of the world, for we lurched and jolted terribly. I tried to look out of the windows to see something of where we were, but they were made of frosted glass, and I could make out nothing save the occasional bright blur of a passing light. Now and then I hazarded some remark to break the monotony of the journey, but the Colonel answered only in monosyllables, and the conversation soon flagged. At last, however, the bumping of the road was exchanged for the crisp smoothness of a gravel drive, and the carriage came to a stand. Colonel Lysander Stark sprang out, and, as I followed after him, pulled me swiftly into a porch which gaped in front of us. We stepped, as it were, right out of the carriage and into the hall, so that I failed to catch the most fleeting glance at the front of the house. The instant that I had crossed the threshold, the door slammed heavily behind us, and I heard faintly the rattle of the wheels as the carriage drove away. It was pitch dark inside the house, and the colonel fumbled about looking for matches and muttering under his breath. Suddenly a door opened at the other end of the passage, and a long golden bar of light shot out in our direction. It grew broader and a woman appeared with a lamp in her hand, which she held above her head, pushing her face forward and peering at us. I could see that she was pretty, and from the gloss with which the light shone upon her dark dress, I knew that it was a rich material. She spoke a few words in a foreign tongue, in a tone as though asking a question, and when my companion answered in a gruff monosyllable, she gave such a start that the lamp nearly fell from her hand. Colonel Stark went up to her, whispered something in her ear, and then, pushing her back into the room from whence she had come, he walked towards me again with the lamp in his hand. "'Perhaps you will have the kindness to wait in this room for a few minutes,' said he, throwing open another door. It was a quiet, little plainly furnished room with a round table in the centre on which several german books were scattered colonel stark laid down the lamp on the top of a harmonium beside the door i shall not keep you waiting an instant said he and vanished into the darkness i glanced at the books upon the table and in spite of my ignorance of German I could see that two of them were treatises on science, the others being volumes of poetry. Then I walked across to the window, hoping that I might catch some glimpse of the countryside, but an oak shutter heavily barred was folded across it. 
it was a wonderfully silent house. There was an old clock ticking loudly somewhere in the passage, but otherwise everything was deadly still. A vague feeling of uneasiness began to steal over me. Who were these German people, and what were they doing living in this strange out-of-the-way place, and where was the place? I was ten miles or so from Eiford, that was all I knew but whether north, south, east, or west, I had no idea. For that matter, Reading and possibly other large towns were within that radius, so the place might not be so secluded after all. Yet it was quite certain from the absolute stillness that we were in the country. I paced up and down the room, humming a tune under my breath to keep up my spirits, and feeling that I was thoroughly earning my fifty-guinea fee. End of Part 1 of Adventure 9 The Adventure of the Engineer's Thumb